Chapter 38, The Journey Around Edom. This chapter is based on Numbers 20, verses 14 to 29, and chapter 21, 1 to 9. The encampment of Israel at Kadesh was but a short distance from the borders of Edom, and both Moses and the people greatly desired to follow the route through this country to the promised land. Accordingly, they sent a message, as God had directed them, to the Edomite king. Thus saith thy brother Israel, Thou knowest all the travel that hath befallen us, how our fathers went down into Egypt, and we have dwelt in Egypt a long time. And the Egyptians vexed us and our fathers. And when we cried unto the Lord, he heard our voice, and sent an angel, and hath brought us forth out of Egypt. And behold, we are in Kadesh, a city in the uttermost of thy border. Let us pass, I pray thee, through thy country. We will not pass through the fields, or through the vineyards, neither will we drink of the water of the wells. We will go by the king's highway. We will not turn to the right hand nor to the left until we have passed thy borders. To this courteous request a threatening refusal was returned. Thou shalt not pass by me, lest I come out against thee with the sword. Surprised at this repulse, the leaders of Israel sent a second appeal to the king with the promise, We will go by the highway. And if I and my cattle drink of thy water, then I will pay for it. I will only, without doing anything else, go through on my feet. Thou shalt not go through, was the answer. Armed bands of Edomites were already posted at the difficult passes, so that any peaceful advance in that direction was impossible, and the Hebrews were forbidden to resort to force. They must make the long journey around the land of Edom. Had the people, when brought into trial, trusted in God, the captain of the Lord's host would have led them through Edom, and the fear of them would have rested upon the inhabitants of the land, so that, instead of manifesting hostility, they would have shown them favor. But the Israelites did not act promptly upon God's word, and while they were complaining and murmuring, the golden opportunity passed. When they were at last ready to present their request to the king, it was refused. Ever since they left Egypt, Satan had been steadily at work to throw hindrances and temptations in their way that they might not inherit Canaan. And by their own unbelief, they had repeatedly opened the door for him to resist the purpose of God. It is important to believe God's word and act upon it promptly, while his angels are waiting to work for us. Evil angels are ready to contest every step of advance. And when God's providence bids his children go forward, when he is ready to do great things for them, Satan tempts them to displease the Lord by hesitation and delay. He seeks to kindle a spirit of strife, or to arouse murmuring or unbelief, and thus deprive them of the blessings that God desired to bestow. God's servants should be minute men, ever ready to move as fast as his providence opens a way. Any delay on their part gives time for Satan to work to defeat them. In the directions first given to Moses concerning their passage through Edom, after declaring that the Edomites should be afraid of Israel, the Lord had forbidden his people to make use of this advantage against them. Because the power of God was engaged for Israel, and the fears of the Edomites would make them an easy prey, the Hebrews were not therefore to prey upon them. The command given them was, Take ye good heed unto yourselves, therefore, meddle not with them, for I will not give you of their land, no, not so much as a foot breadth, because I have given Mount Seir unto Esau for a possession. Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. The Edomites were descendants of Abraham and Isaac, and for the sake of these his servants, God had shown favor to the children of Esau. He had given them Mount Seir for a possession, and they were not to be disturbed unless by their sins they should place themselves beyond the reach of his mercy. The Hebrews were to dispossess and utterly destroy the inhabitants of Canaan, who had filled up the measure of their iniquity. But the Edomites were still probationers, 
and as such were to be mercifully dealt with. God delights in mercy, and He manifests His compassion before He inflicts His judgments. He teaches Israel to spare the people of Edom before requiring them to destroy the inhabitants of Canaan. The ancestors of Edom and Israel were brothers, and brotherly kindness and courtesy should exist between them. The Israelites were forbidden, either then or at any future time, to revenge the affront given them in the refusal of passage through the land. They must not expect to possess any part of the land of Edom. While the Israelites were the chosen and favored people of God, they must heed the restrictions which He placed upon them. God had promised them a goodly inheritance, but they were not to feel that they alone had any rights in the earth and seek to crowd out all others. They were directed in all their intercourse with the Edomites to beware of doing them injustice. They were to trade with them, buying such supplies as were needed, and promptly paying for all they had received. As an encouragement to Israel to trust in God and obey His word, they were reminded, The Lord thy God hath blessed thee. Thou hast lacked nothing. Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 7. They were not dependent upon the Edomites, for they had a God rich in resources. They must not by force or fraud seek to obtain anything pertaining to them. But in all their intercourse they should exemplify the principle of the divine law, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Had they in this manner passed through Edom as God had purposed, the passage would have proved a blessing, not only to themselves, but to the inhabitants of the land, for it would have given them an opportunity to become acquainted with God's people and His worship, and to witness how the God of Jacob prospered those who loved and feared Him. But all this the unbelief of Israel had prevented. God had given the people water in answer to their clamors, but He permitted their unbelief to work out its punishment. Again they must traverse the desert and quench their thirst from the miraculous spring, which, had they but trusted in Him, they would no longer have needed. Accordingly the hosts of Israel again turned toward the south, and made their way over sterile wastes, that seemed even more dreary after a glimpse of the green spots among the hills and the valleys of Edom. From the mountain range overlooking this gloomy desert rises Mount Hor, whose summit was to be the place of Aaron's death and burial. When the Israelites came to this mountain, the divine command was addressed to Moses, Take Aaron and Eleazar his son, and bring them up into Mount Hor and strip Aaron of his garments, and put them upon Eleazar his son, and Aaron shall be gathered unto his people, and shall die there. Together these two aged men and the younger one toiled up the mountain height. The heads of Moses and Aaron were white with the snows of six score winters. Their long and eventful lives had been marked with the deepest trials and the greatest honors that had ever fallen to the lot of man. They were men of great natural ability, and all their powers had been developed, exalted, and dignified by communion with the Infinite One. Their life had been spent in unselfish labor for God and their fellow men. Their countenances gave evidence of great intellectual power, firmness, and nobility of purpose, and strong affections. Many years Moses and Aaron had stood side by side in their cares and labors. Together they had breasted unnumbered dangers, and had shared together the signal blessing of God. But the time was at hand when they must be separated. They moved on very slowly, for every moment in each other's society was precious. The ascent was steep and toilsome, and as they often paused to rest, they communed together of the past and the future. Before them, as far as the eye could reach, was spread out the scene of their desert wanderings. In the plain below were encamped the vast hosts of Israel, for whom these chosen men had spent the best portion of their lives, for whose welfare they had felt so deep an interest, and made so great sacrifices. Somewhere beyond the mountains of Edom was the path leading to the Promised Land, 
that land whose blessings Moses and Aaron were not to enjoy. No rebellious feelings found a place in their hearts. No expression of murmuring escaped their lips. Yet a solemn sadness rested upon their countenances as they remembered what had debarred them from the inheritance of their fathers. Aaron's work for Israel was done. Forty years before, at the age of eighty-three, God had called him to unite with Moses in his great and important mission. He had cooperated with his brother in leading the children of Israel from Egypt. He had held up the great leader's hands when the Hebrew host gave battle to Amalek. He had been permitted to ascend Mount Sinai, to approach into the presence of God and to behold the divine glory. The Lord had conferred upon the family of Aaron the office of the priesthood and had honored him with the sacred consecration of high priest. He had sustained him in the holy office by the terrible manifestations of divine judgment in the destruction of Korah and his company. It was through Aaron's intercession that the plague was stayed. When his two sons were slain for disregarding God's express command, he did not rebel or even murmur. Yet the record of his noble life had been marred. Aaron committed a grievous sin when he yielded to the clamors of the people and made the golden calf at Sinai, and again when he united with Miriam in envy and murmuring against Moses. And he, with Moses, offended the Lord at Kadesh by disobeying the command to speak to the rock that it might give forth its water. God intended that these great leaders of his people should be representatives of Christ. Aaron bore the names of Israel upon his breast. He communicated to the people the will of God. He entered the most holy place on the day of atonement, not without blood, as a mediator for all Israel. He came forth from that work to bless the congregation, as Christ will come forth to bless his waiting people when his work of atonement in their behalf shall be ended. It was the exalted character of that sacred office as representative of our great high priest that made Aaron's sin at Kadesh of so great magnitude. With deep sorrow, Moses removed from Aaron the holy vestments and placed them upon Eliezer who thus became his successor by divine appointment. For his sin at Kadesh, Aaron was denied the privilege of officiating as God's high priest in Canaan, of offering the first sacrifice in the goodly land, and thus consecrating the inheritance of Israel. Moses was to continue to bear his burden in leading the people to the very borders of Canaan. He was to come within sight of the promised land, but was not to enter it. Had these servants of God, when they stood before the rock at Kadesh, borne unmurmuringly the test there brought upon them, how different would have been their future? A wrong act can never be undone. It may be that the work of a lifetime will not recover what has been lost in a single moment of temptation or even thoughtlessness. The absence from the camp of the two great leaders, and the fact that they had been accompanied by Eliezer, who it was well known was to be Aaron's successor in holy office, awakened a feeling of apprehension, and their return was anxiously awaited. As the people looked about them upon their vast congregation, they saw that nearly all the adults who left Egypt had perished in the wilderness. All felt a foreboding of evil as they remembered the sentence pronounced against Moses and Aaron. Some were aware of the object of that mysterious journey to the summit of Mount Hor, and their solicitude for their leaders was heightened by bitter memories and self-accusings. The forms of Moses and Eliezer were at last discerned, slowly descending the mountainside, but Aaron was not with them. Upon Eliezer were the sacerdotal garments, showing that he had succeeded his father in the sacred office. As the people with heavy hearts gathered about their leader, Moses told them that Aaron had died in his arms upon Mount Hor, and that they there buried him. The congregation broke forth in mourning and lamentation, for they all loved Aaron, though they had so often caused him sorrow. They mourned for Aaron thirty days, even all the house of Israel. Concerning the burial of Israel's high priest, the scriptures give only the simple record 
There Aaron died, and there he was buried. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 6. In what striking contrast to the customs of the present day was this burial, conducted according to the express command of God? In modern times, the funeral services of a man of high position are often made the occasion of ostentatious and extravagant display. When Aaron died, one of the most illustrious men that ever lived, there were only two of his nearest friends to witness his death and to attend his burial. And that lonely grave upon Mount Hor was forever hidden from the sight of Israel. God is not honored in the great display so often made over the dead, and the extravagant expense incurred in returning their bodies to the dust. The whole congregation sorrowed for Aaron, yet they could not feel the loss so keenly as did Moses. The death of Aaron forcibly reminded Moses that his own end was near. But short as the time of his stay on earth must be, he deeply felt the loss of his constant companion, the one who had shared his joys and sorrows, his hopes and fears for so many long years. Moses must now continue the work alone, but he knew that God was his friend, and upon him he leaned more heavily. Soon after leaving Mount Hor, the Israelites suffered defeat in an engagement with Arad, one of the Canaanite kings. But as they earnestly sought help from God, divine aid was granted them, and their enemies were routed. This victory, instead of inspiring gratitude and leading the people to feel their dependence upon God, made them boastful and self-confident. Soon they fell into the old habit of murmuring. They were now dissatisfied because the armies of Israel had not been permitted to advance upon Canaan immediately after their rebellion at the report of the spies nearly forty years before. They pronounced their long sojourn in the wilderness an unnecessary delay, reasoning that they might have conquered their enemies as easily heretofore as now. As they continued their journey toward the south, their route lay through a hot, sandy valley, destitute of shade or vegetation. The way seemed long and difficult, and they suffered from weariness and thirst. Again they failed to endure the test of their faith and patience. By continually dwelling on the dark side of their experiences, they separated themselves farther and farther from God. They lost sight of the fact that but for their murmuring when the water ceased at Kadesh, they would have been spared the journey around Edom. God had purposed better things for them. Their hearts should have been filled with gratitude to Him that He had punished their sin so lightly. But instead of this, they flattered themselves that if God and Moses had not interfered, they might now have been in possession of the promised land. After bringing trouble upon themselves, making their lot altogether harder than God designed, they charged all their misfortunes upon Him. Thus they cherished bitter thoughts concerning His dealings with them, and finally they became discontented with everything. Egypt looked brighter and more desirable than liberty and the land to which God was leading them. As the Israelites indulged the spirit of discontent, they were disposed to find fault even with their blessings. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. Moses faithfully set before the people their great sin. It was God's power alone that had preserved them in that great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 15. Every day of their travels they had been kept by a miracle of divine mercy. In all the way of God's leading they had found water to refresh the thirsty, bread from heaven to satisfy their hunger, and peace and safety under the shadowy cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. Angels had ministered to them as they climbed the rocky heights or threaded the rugged paths of the wilderness. Notwithstanding the hardships they had endured, there was not a feeble one in all their ranks. Their feet had not swollen in their long journeys, neither had their clothes grown old. God had subdued before them the fierce beasts of prey and the venomous reptiles of the forest and the desert. 
If with all these tokens of his love, the people still continued to complain, the Lord would withdraw his protection until they should be led to appreciate his merciful care and return to him with repentance and humiliation. Because they had been shielded by divine power, they had not realized the countless dangers by which they were continually surrounded. In their ingratitude and unbelief they had anticipated death, and now the Lord permitted death to come upon them. The poisonous serpents that infested the wilderness were called fiery serpents on account of the terrible effects produced by their sting. It caused violent inflammation and speedy death. As the protecting hand of God was removed from Israel, great numbers of the people were attacked by these venomous creatures. Now there was terror and confusion throughout the encampment. In almost every tent were the dying or the dead. None were secure. Often the silence of night was broken by piercing cries that told of fresh victims. All were busy in ministering to the sufferers, or with agonizing care endeavoring to protect those who were not yet stricken. No murmuring now escaped their lips. When compared with the present suffering, their former difficulties and trials seemed unworthy of a thought. The people now humbled themselves before God. They came to Moses with their confessions and entreaties. We have sinned, they said, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Only a little before, they had accused him of being their worst enemy, the cause of all their distress and afflictions. But even when the words were upon their lips, they knew that the charge was false, and as soon as real trouble came, they fled to him as the only one who could intercede with God for them. Pray unto the Lord, was their cry, that he take away the serpents from us. Moses was divinely commanded to make a serpent of brass resembling the living ones, and to elevate it among the people. To this all who had been bitten were to look, and they would find relief. He did so, and the joyful news was sounded throughout the encampment that all who had been bitten might look upon the brazen serpent and live. Many had already died, and when Moses raised the serpent upon the pole, some would not believe that merely gazing upon that metallic image would heal them. These perished in their unbelief. Yet there were many who had faith in the provision which God had made. Fathers, mothers, brothers, and sisters were anxiously engaged in helping their suffering, dying friends to fix their languid eyes upon the serpent. If these, though faint and dying, could only once look, they were perfectly restored. The people well knew that there was no power in the serpent of brass to cause such a change in those who looked upon it. The healing virtue was from God alone. In his wisdom, he chose this way of displaying his power. By this simple means, the people were made to realize that this affliction had been brought upon them by their sins. They were also assured that while obeying God, they had no reason to fear, for he would preserve them. The lifting up of the brazen serpent was to teach Israel an important lesson. They could not save themselves from the fatal effect of the poison in their wounds. God alone was able to heal them. Yet they were required to show their faith in the provision which he had made. They must look in order to live. It was their faith that was acceptable with God, and by looking upon the serpent, their faith was shown. They knew that there was no virtue in the serpent itself, but it was a symbol of Christ, and the necessity of faith in his merits was thus presented to their minds. Heretofore many had brought their offerings to God and had felt that in so doing they made ample atonement for their sins. They did not rely upon the Redeemer to come, of whom these offerings were only a type. The Lord would now teach them that their sacrifices in themselves had no more power or virtue than the serpent of brass, but were, like that, to lead their minds to Christ, the great sin offering. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so was the Son of Man lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15.
All who have ever lived upon the earth have felt the deadly sting of that old serpent called the devil and Satan. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. The fatal effects of sin can be removed only by the provision that God has made. The Israelites saved their lives by looking upon the uplifted serpent. That look implied faith. They lived because they believed God's word and trusted in the means provided for their recovery. So the sinner may look to Christ and live. He receives pardon through faith in the atoning sacrifice. Unlike the inert and lifeless symbol, Christ has power and virtue in himself to heal the repenting sinner. While the sinner cannot save himself, he still has something to do to secure salvation. Him that cometh to me, says Christ, I will in no wise cast out. John chapter 6, verse 37. But we must come to him. And when we repent of our sins, we must believe that he accepts and pardons us. Faith is a gift of God, but the power to exercise it is ours. Faith is the hand by which the soul takes hold upon the divine offers of grace and mercy. Nothing but the righteousness of Christ can entitle us to one of the blessings of the covenant of grace. There are many who have long desired and tried to obtain these blessings, but have not received them, because they have cherished the idea that they could do something to make themselves worthy of them. They have not looked away from self, believing that Jesus is an all-sufficient Savior. We must not think that our own merits will save us. Christ is our only hope of salvation. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. When we trust God fully, when we rely upon the merits of Jesus as a sin-pardoning Savior, we shall receive all the help that we can desire. Let none look to self as though they had power to save themselves. Jesus died for us because we were helpless to do this. In him is our hope, our justification, our righteousness. When we see our sinfulness, we should not despond and fear that we have no Savior, or that he has no thoughts of mercy toward us. At this very time, he is inviting us to come to him in our helplessness and be saved. Many of the Israelites saw no help in the remedy which heaven had appointed. The dead and dying were all around them, and they knew that without divine aid their own fate was certain. But they continued to lament their wounds, their pains, their sure death, until their strength was gone and their eyes were glazed, when they might have had instant healing. If we are conscious of our needs, we should not devote all our powers to mourning over them. While we realize our helpless condition without Christ, we are not to yield to discouragement, but rely upon the merits of a crucified and risen Savior. Look and live. Jesus has pledged his word. He will save all who come unto him. Though millions who need to be healed will reject his offered mercy, not one who trusts in his merits will be left to perish. Many are unwilling to accept of Christ until the whole mystery of the plan of salvation shall be made plain to them. They refuse the look of faith, although they see that thousands have looked and have felt the efficacy of looking to the cross of Christ. Many wander in the mazes of philosophy in search of reasons and evidence which they will never find while they reject the evidence which God has been pleased to give. They refuse to walk in the light of the Son of Righteousness until the reason of its shining shall be explained. All who persist in this course will fail to come to a knowledge of the truth. God will never remove every occasion for doubt. He gives sufficient evidence on which to base faith, and if this is not accepted, the mind is left in darkness. If those who were bitten by the serpents had stopped to doubt and question before they would consent to look, they would have perished. It is our duty first to look, and the look of faith will give us life.